as we humbly bow our heads before thee at this time, we thank thee for this opportunity, Father, to gather here as a state central committee to conduct the business of the Republican Party for the state of Utah. Father, at this time, we ask a blessing upon our armed forces who are out serving and protecting our country. We ask a blessing upon our elected officials, the President of the United States, and our other elected officials, members of Congress, our governor, that they would lead us in the right direction, Father. We pray for the chairman of our party and the SEC members gathered today that we might conduct the business in a manner that would be pleasing unto thee, that we might stand for principle and speak what is in our hearts. Father, we are grateful for the religious freedoms that we enjoy, the right to gather as a political organization, and all of the many great things that our country has offered to us. We pray, Father, that we might continue to teach and understand these principles to the coming generation, that we may do our part in helping to continue this trend. We love thee so very much, Father, and we humbly pray for these things and do so in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to remind everyone there's not a comma between one nation and under God. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Grace, and thank you, Jackie. Uh, one more announcement on a solemn note. Uh, Davis Central Committee met Representative Lee Scablin passed away earlier this week. Uh, let us observe a moment of silence in his honor. Thank you. I will contact the staff of, uh, I think, uh, Davis County, and we will send out an email of, of when his uh, observances will be, so anyone that would like to attend may attend. First item of business on the agenda is the, or of the order of the day is the adoption of the agenda. Are there any amendments to the agenda? Yes, Mr. Chair. Okay, the Chair recognizes uh, Joe Levi. Joe Levi, uh, I'm the President of the Republican Natives and a member of the Executive Committee. In our executive committee on the 8th of May, I was asked by that committee that we make some modifications to the agenda. A few of those have already been reflected in the agenda that was printed out. The two that were not are as follows. So I would move that the agenda be amended such that uh, between items 4 and 5 is inserted committee reports to include the Constitutional Defense Committee, Data and Software Management Committee and Grassroots Funding Fundraising Committee. And as a sub-item beneath the Secretary's report, that formal approval of all minutes of prior SEC meetings be included. Okay, the motion on the floor is uh, after between items four and five, a committee report from the Grassroots Funding Committee, the Constitutional Defense Committee, the, uh, what was the third committee? The Data and Technology Committee. Uh, and also, after the Secretary's report, include a discussion and an approval of the minutes. As far as the committee is concerned, as far as the agenda, we've had this discussion numerous times, and I'll have it again right now with you. The bylaws are very clear about the schedule and the agenda as how it's supposed to be printed out. The committee reports are, come in that order after the delegation reports in that bylaw. If we were to uh, uh, pass this motion, it requires a two-thirds majority. Is that correct? Because of... Okay, that one would take two-thirds. As far as the minutes are concerned, we had this discussion last meeting. Bylaw 2.C states that the agenda items must be submitted to the party in written form and received at party headquarters one week prior to the official minute meeting notice being sent to members. It also states that the minutes, along with other documents to be considered at the meeting, must be included in the call to be considered. Although the chair and staff have repeatedly requested minutes from the party secretary since May 2017 prior to every meeting, 
<clears throat> deadline established by the bylaws, the secretary has failed to provide the minutes in compliance with this bylaw. Until May 4th, 2018, the party officers and staff have not had access to the Google Doc where the secretary apparently has kept the minutes. This document is not housed on the party server, nor is it considered part of the party document storage. We are in hopes that the secretary will endeavor to execute her duties and have the minutes available one week prior to the official meeting notice being sent to members so that we can consider the minutes at our next meeting. It is disturbing to me personally that the party has not addressed and, and uh, approved minutes for, for at least more than a year. The reason this is, is audits and legal matters before the party uh, are problematic when they're discussed based on the fact that we don't have, we're operating without minutes that have been approved for the last uh, five meetings that we've held. Point of order. We will cons consider these approvals at the next meeting. Point of order, Mr. Chair. I am not uh, acknowledging you at this point. I'm still in my statement. I will get to you after this. If someone moves to suspend the rules and allows the minutes to be taken up, which the rules, let me just cover this. Don't, uh, don't make that motion because <clears throat> the, the, the minutes were not included. They were sent out by the secretary after, on May 4th, after the deadline, which was 5 p.m., to all of the members out there. The rules cannot be suspended. And this is Robert's Rules of Order, page 263 and 264. Rules that cannot be suspended. Rules contained in the bylaws or the Constitution cannot be suspended. No matter how large the vote in favor of doing so or, or how inconvenient the rule in question may be, it cannot be suspended. Rules protecting absentees, people that cannot attend, cannot be suspended even by unanimous consent or actual unanimous vote because the absentees do not consent to such suspension. Okay. Okay, the chair recognizes Janice Legler. Hi, uh, Janice Legler, Davis County, uh, CMB chair. I'd like to make note of our constitution, which trumps the bylaws, which says in uh, Article 4, I believe, Article 4, E, notice of meetings. A regular quarterly state central committee meeting shall be noticed by postmarking it agenda at least two weeks before the intended meeting. A special central committee meeting shall be noticed by postmarking the agenda at least one week before the intended meeting. No business may be considered at a state central committee unless properly noticed by inclusion in the agenda, except if a majority of the members in attendance vote to add the item to the agenda. That trumps the bylaws, number one. Number two, Lisa's email regarding the minutes, they were on the, the call originally and it was stripped off before it was sent and so she sent out an agenda with all of the information to her minutes before the five o'clock deadline. She met the deadline this time. That time was 4.54 p.m. and we had it before the last meeting as well. Uh, I'm not aware of that. Uh, that is uh, Janice's opinion only. It does say in the Constitution no, what, is, what is said there. Do you have proof of that? Can you bring that forward? Yeah, yeah. Fred does. Okay, and where are the meeting, the minutes? They're right there. Yep. They've got them all there. There's PDFs, there's links. So it was a link and it was not a file that was sent? No, no. They're we had access to the minutes. This was sent out at just before, let's see, it's 454 yeah, so it's just Mr. Chair? It has to be up to 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 5 I can show you when it was sent. Mr. Chair, may I address this, please? <coughs> Mr. Chair, oh, this is loud, sorry. May I address this, please? It's 
four fifty four. So the question before us is, are you appealing the rule of the chair? Okay. Make sure that Could you stand up and make that clear? There's a point of order to begin with, but if I need to, I can appeal the ruling of the chair. I second. I ruled that point was not well taken and sound. Now you would appeal the rule of the chair. Yes, I would appeal okay. the ruling of the chair. Right, thank you. I think, that I think, and do I speak to that now? Okay. Do this other meeting. Well, all the minutes all the minutes that have passed. Mr. Chair, may I address this? Uh, Peter uh, Simonson, could you please come up forward? Mr. Chair, I may have some of those answers that you're looking up if I could address you. I wonder if this discussion might better be had under those agenda items that were proposed. Therefore, I call the previous question.
email server until after 5 o'clock when I got it. Okay, uh, would everybody please come back to order? The copy the staff was working off of, uh, it, it, it says Central Daylight Time on there, so uh, the 554 was probably 454 Mountain Daylight Time. Uh, whether or not I was in Dallas, Texas at the time or not, I may have been, uh, but the staff was working on it, so I'm going to retract that. The minutes, has, my question now is, has everyone in the room had an opportunity to review the minutes before we approve those? Yes. Yes. Those, who have not. those who have not, please raise your hand. Okay, I see one hand up. She had the opportunity, she said. This is a notice issue. Jackie, did you receive that? Okay, all right. So she received that. Okay. Anybody else? Mr. Chair, I might provide just a little bit more information for you so I can help your ruling. I don't think anything you can say here is going to affect the decision. So here's, uh, here's what's before us. Uh, the two motions on the floor, uh, let's bifurcate those uh, into two separate votes because uh, the uh, adding the committee reports after the chairman's report requires a two-thirds majority vote there, uh, as well as the secretary minutes only require a majority vote at that point to add those. So. Uh, Do we, do we need to discuss or debate this? No. Okay. All right. Without objection, we'll go into the uh, votes for these particular items here. Uh, the first one, to add the Grassroots Funding Committee, the Constitutional Defense Committee, and the Data and Technologies Committee to the agenda between items four and five requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor, please raise your credential. Okay, thank you. All those opposed, please raise your credential. Okay, the chair is in doubt. Uh, I request that, uh, based on the two-thirds, uh, I request those, uh, uh, is there anyone not able to stand today? Okay? Okay, great, okay. Back to the original question. All in favor of a uh, two-thirds majority required, all in favor of adding these, please stand and raise your credential. Okay, please take your seats. All those opposed, please stand and raise your credential. Okay, we're going to count that. It's still too close. So, uh, please... On this side, Abe, can you take care of this side? And over here, can we get a volunteer? I'll do it. Kirby, that's fine. Kirby, so all in favor of adding this, please stand and raise your credential. When you're counted, please take your seat. Thank you. 
Okay. All those opposed, please stand and be counted. The number uh, four adding that item was 62. The number opposed was 44. Uh, that uh, does not pass. That will not be added to the agenda. The next item is uh, adding the minutes to the secretary's report. It requires Porter, a majority vote. Port of in inquiry on here. I'm sorry, Rob. We don't have a, a credentialed number yet, do we? No, we don't. We don't need okay. a credentialed okay. number okay. at this okay. point. But my question is, uh, have the auxiliaries that are here been credentialed? Yes, they have. They have not been approved. They shouldn't be credentialed until they've been approved. Uh, I will get to that and eventually. Would you like to discuss that now? Yeah, I'm just saying they shouldn't be voting. Their They're, vote. Should they were not approved have in September, and they are still credentialed members. No, they were the not. Body. They were not approved. That, that statement's not true. Hang on a second. Okay, auxiliaries, auxiliaries. All existing auxiliaries were approved at the September 8, 2017 SCC meeting. In addition, a new auxiliary was approved at that meeting. Let me read from the preliminary minutes from the secretary regarding that meeting. Utah GOP auxiliary approvals. Existing, this is the September 9th meeting, existing auxiliaries, one, the Utah Federation of Republican Women, two, the Utah Hispanic Republican Assembly, three, the Black Republican Assembly, four, the Young Republicans, five, the College Republicans, and six, the Teenage Republicans. The chair announced that the parliamentarian and the EC reviewed the auxiliary applications. However, no EC recommendation was forwarded due to a lack of decorum. May I add that we met twice and did not have a quorum to make a recommendation at that time. At 12.41 p.m., the chair moved. Without objection, these auxiliaries will be retained in their current form. Elizabeth Carlin of Weber County objected and moved to have each auxiliary voted on separately, one by one. The chair called for a standing raised credential vote. The chair ruled the motion failed. Elizabeth Car Carlin called for a division count. The chair renewed without objection the current auxiliaries will be approved because a division is done by a standing vote. <clears throat> the point of order was raised that a division had been called on the vote. The chair restated the motion and asked the members to stand. The count was reported as 22 yay and 30 nays. The chair moved without objection. Those are our current auxiliaries. There was no objection. The chair announced one new auxiliary application that was approved, the Rural Utah Republican Alliance. He moved, without objection, the Rural Utah Republican Alliance will become a member auxiliary of the Utah Republican Party. No objection. The chair announced that there were two applications that did not, did not meet the requirements and their application is in, until their application is in order, they will not be considered. A request for information was raised at 12.43 p.m. by Kira Berkland of Morgan County requesting a outline process of the approval and the reasons for denial. The chair stated that the Women's Liberty Caucus did not meet several of the requirements with the reason for denial was a different platform than the Utah Republican parties and that the, all the other auxiliaries use and comply with the Utah Republican platform. Vice Chair Joni Crane also stated that the Women's Liberty Caucus was invited and declined to join another women's organization. She stated that an educational letter would be sent with needed changes and the requesting auxiliaries could reapply at that time. She said that the only existing auxiliaries had to apply by this meeting. 
the chair and the party would work with the applicant to get that approved and that the party needs to ensure that the auxiliaries comply with the bylaws. Request Those are the for minutes. information. Stand by. There is, uh, that is from the minutes. At the February 24th, 2018 meeting, a bylaw was adopted to change some of the criteria for an auxiliary to petition or retain its status within the party. A proviso was adopted that required all current auxiliaries all current auxiliaries to demonstrate that they comply with the new criteria prior to the next regularly scheduled SCC meeting. That current meeting is today. The current auxiliaries were not revoked, but simply required to produce evidence of compliance with the new requirements as follows. Bylaw 3.0 B.8 states, all current auxiliaries shall have until the next scheduled state central committee meeting, that's this meeting, after the passage of this bylaw to demonstrate they comply. All current auxiliaries, with the exception of one, submitted the required documentation prior to the scheduled EC meeting of May 8. That EC meeting did not meet the quorum, despite the fact that the quorum was calculated not including those auxiliaries. I will say that if you lit, wait till the end of this, I will show you that the auxiliaries are still auxiliaries at that point, and they did not meet the quorum requirement based on the auxiliaries still having membership in that body. The EC meeting did not meet the quorum requirements and the EC did not review or make any recommendation regarding current auxiliaries. There is one auxiliary that was approved after the adoption of the bylaw above. That auxiliary is exempt from this requirement to resubmit document, documentation. Under bylaw 3.0b, the state executive committee shall ensure the groups petitioning for official auxiliary status meet the following minimum requirements. One, have submitted a copy of the group's bylaws to the State Executive Committee for review. Two, the group's stated purpose and bylaws comply with and assist the party's purpose of electing Republicans to office. Three, the group provides a list of at least 25 active members and their contact information to the State Executive Committee. And four, all voting members of the group are registered Republicans. Five, the group shall accept all registered Republicans who meet eligibility requirements as set forth in the auxiliary's by bylaws. Six, the group's documents shall outline the method of election of officers with terms of office not being greater than two years. The auxiliary shall provide written proof of, a, of an election for officers that has been held within the past two years with a minimum of 25 credentialed members participating in that election. Seven, the group shall meet at least quarterly with a minim minimum of 10 members in attendance. Notice of all the meetings shall be noticed to all members. Eight is the proviso. This is the most important part I will read to you today. The proviso will be deleted. Oh, I already read that to you, so it was above. After this compliance, compliance all current auxiliaries shall have until the next scheduled state central committee to demonstrate they comply. Okay. To remain a party auxiliary, they were approved in September according to the Secretary's minutes, according to my recollection of that meeting. To remain a party auxiliary, the auxiliary shall petition prior to the first state central committee meeting following the state organizing convention by providing documents meeting the criteria established in section 3.B. As mentioned, all but one of the current auxiliaries required to submit documentation of compliance with that new bylaw provided that documentation prior to the May 8th Executive Committee meeting. Let me note that there was another meeting called the following week, which also did not meet a quorum. Of the five Executive Committee meetings I have called, four have not reached the quorum requirement. That one auxiliary is the Utah Republican Native American Caucus. Those auxiliaries that have submitted their documentation in accordance with this new bylaw are the Utah Federation of Republican Women, the Utah Federation of College Republicans, the Utah Young Republicans of Utah, the Utah Rep uh, Republican Latino Coalition, Utah Teenaged Republicans, and Utah Black Republicans. These current auxiliaries will remain in effect since this bylaw proviso has no removal process until they are revoked by the SCC. The auxiliary that did not submit the required documentation was the Rural Utah Republican Alliance. We invite this group to make a new application for party considerations as an auxiliary. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Request for information. Chair, 
recognizes. Mr. Chairman, the minutes that you are reading from, are they approved minutes? They are not approved minutes because we haven't had that opportunity to approve those minutes. Point of order, um, I try to get your attention there. Rob, we actually did have a quorum. According to the, the people that we had on the committee, Carrie, if you're counting in the auxiliaries, we weren't counting the auxiliaries because they were not official auxiliaries according to everything that we okay, had. Let's make a determination whether auxiliaries are not before we make a determination. Okay, well, we had several motions in there, and there was a lot of stuff addressed in that meeting. It was a three-hour meeting. You weren't there. for You were on the phone for a little bit of it. You were traveling. But we had a three-hour meeting, and we worked really hard. I'm not taking that away from there. Chair recognizes Don Guy. Mr. Chairman, have we, has the executive committee validated that every one of these auxiliaries has had an election in the last two years and has had a quarterly activity? That no. documentation was provided. The exec executive committee has not made a quorum requirement, so as that's a I, statement. I, I, that as a member of the executive committee, I have, I've seen, we received the bylaws, but we have not had whether they're following and whether they've had the election. Has that occurred? It, and regardless, there has not been a quorum requirement in my interpretation uh, that, to make a decision on that. So I, I don't disagree with your assessment there. It's just two different ways of getting the same thing. The Ms. executive committee has not made a determination Mr. of these Chair, bodies. I would like to make a correction to your statement. Okay. At this point, we've gone down a rabbit hole with, with all of this. And so point of order. at this point, the SCC, this body has two possible recourses. One is to wait for the EC to meet and review and provide recommendations to the SCC with regard to the current auxiliaries and the remaining auxiliaries of the party, to remain auxiliaries of the party, okay? So that's the first option. The second is to discharge this matter from the executive committee and consider the approval of the auxiliaries at this SCC meeting. The party, we are provide, ready to provide uh, SCC members with the documentations, and I believe all the auxiliaries are here to speak to the uh, requirements that set forth in this bylaw. Request what is the pleasure of the SCC in this matter? Request for information. Where, where, where do you get the information that the executive committee had all of those bylaws before the meeting? They were, I opened they up. They were emailed. Staff. Uh, they were not. They were, there was a link that was, that was emailed, and when I opened that link prior to the meeting, there was one set of bylaws in there. We did not have a chance to go through those bylaws and vet them before that meeting. That I believe I was there. on the phone at that portion of the conversation, yeah. and, and the conversation was we went through the college Republicans, and then we decided to, uh, you made a motion, and decided to table those and, and discuss those at a later time when the chairs could be present at the meeting. So th that tells me that the information was available and being considered there. No, uh, no, it was not there. We okay. did not have the information, so we couldn't and, get them. And regardless, my assessment is that we did not have a quorum at that point. So. We did have a quorum. Yeah, point of clarification on that. Does the staff have the documentation emailed to everyone right now? Can you send out the link? Lisa forwarded it to us. So the clarification was at that meeting of the 8th of the executive committee meeting, at that meeting there was a count held and it was determined in that meeting that there was indeed a quorum present. There were no objections to that quorum made in that meeting. Going back in time to say that a quorum wasn't present based on a different set of rules seems to be inappropriate and out of order. We did hear multiple uh, applications, petitions from auxiliaries, one of which seemed in order one of which by the chair of that auxiliary's own admittance needed a little bit more work and we were tasked with working with that auxiliary to bring their organization in line. This was an admission of that auxiliary chair and the unanimous decision at that meeting was that all current auxiliaries be considered as petitioning anew, no objection was raised, and that each one be considered as soon as possible, as soon as a representative of that auxiliary was present to answer questions put forth by the executive committee. That was also a unanimous decision at that meeting as well. Okay, as far as the last statement there, Joe, you, you cannot make a new criteria uh, within your body and, and require, the, for instance, the chair to, to be present, which was not a requirement With, with respect, sir, um, the Republican Native American Caucus appealed. They petitioned to be uh, considered. 
since there were not meetings of the executive committee meeting being held, we petitioned to come directly to the SCC for consideration. That petition was denied because staff directed us that we must apply directly to the executive committee before we could be considered at the state central committee. And staff directed that we needed to have a representative present at the executive committee meeting. So I ask, is the leadership of the Utah Republican Party singling out Native Americans as having a different standard by which they must apply to petition? Or are we going to hold everyone a, to the same set of rules? That's argumentative and, and it, uh, it's it not is. And, and I don't want do you, this. Do you have facts that would provide I, that? I just listed my facts. If you would like me to provide facts from, from staff that said that, I would be happy we're, to do so. We're not so. here to argue. I'm this. asking that the same level of standards by our auxiliary be provided and followed by all of the remainder. Parliamentary inquiry. We, we asked, okay, we, we have the documentation for all these auxiliaries. There is no method of removal with this new bylaw. We talked oh. about this yesterday, Don. I know, I, I just want to make a clarification. I'm not, uh, but, you know, we, we asked about whether we had access to the documents. This is important. I have an email that I sent five minutes after receiving the, after receiving the agenda at that afternoon before the executive committee meetings stating that I could not access several of the several of the auxiliaries bylaws. So I have that that I'd emailed the the party about five minutes after receiving the agenda. So So the, the, the bylaw does not automatically remove these, and so they stay credentialed until this body re revokes their credentials or they, uh, uh, re if they don't comply with those. And so based on the fact that uh, the, the executive committee did not meet the quorum requirements and did not discuss these, also the, these applications are out there, so... So, and the chair rules that they're credentialed members based on that. So if we want to go down the rabbit hole, here's the, the two, again, I will say the two possible actions from this body right now. One is to wait for the EC to meet, review, and provide recommendations to the SCC with regard to current auxiliaries, remaining auxiliaries of the party, meaning they stay auxiliaries until that point. Or we discharge the matter from the EC and consider the approval of this auxiliary at this EC meeting. And I would entertain a motion to that extent. Okay. I'm going to appeal the, I'll appeal the ruling of the chair then. Okay. Okay. You, you rule that they're credentialed. I'll appeal that ruling of the chair. Okay. So you would like to make a motion, and the motion is you would like to re uh, all these auxiliaries. W which auxiliaries would you like to remove from? Uh, I'll appeal the ruling of the chair. All right. So he's saying he's made the ruling. Drew, do you mean all except the Native Americans and the Utah College Republicans? That were subsequently approved. It sounds like the Native Americans are certainly re complied and so and are there. Okay. I appealed the ruling of the chair. The, the removal. I have appealed the ruling of the chair. Move to a vote. Okay. We can settle that right now. Okay, uh, there's appeal to the ruling of the chair, and we're going to put it for a vote. Do you, would, would you like to discuss this further? Nope. Let's take it to a vote. Okay, the ruling of the chair is that the auxiliaries repetition 
the state central committee every two years for to remain in auxiliary status. That is, it, it, my understanding is that and it, and it's automatic, and but there's been no removal process other than they do not comply with the bylaws. Those submissions have been received as of today. We have all of those submissions from all of those auxiliaries which have not been reviewed by the executive committee. So the ruling of the chair is they are auxiliaries until this body votes against that. Okay, so now we will go to a vote. And this is, this is years of precedence and this is how we've done it in the past. Okay, so uh, all in favor of upholding the chair's ruling and the auxiliaries remaining in place until the EC can meet a quorum Isn't there a debate allowed? It would be between the gentleman who raised the question and the chair. And he did not continue the debate, therefore the debate is over. So all in favor of these auxiliaries remaining auxiliaries within the Utah Republican Party until the executive committee meets with a quorum and approves those, please stand and raise your credential. Upholding the ruling of the chair that these credentials, these auxiliaries remain. Okay, please take your seats. Those opposed, please stand and raise your credential. Uh, that's very close. Uh, the chair requests a counted vote, so we'll count again. Abe and uh, Kirby. All in favor of upholding the chair's ruling and the current auxiliaries remain auxiliaries, please stand and raise your credential until you're uh, counted and then take your seats, please. Six and 21. Okay, uh, all those opposed to the chair's ruling stating these auxiliaries are not credentialed individuals and no longer auxiliaries, please stand and raise your credential until you're counted. Did you count the middle here, Kirby? No, I did not count the middle. Like okay. this. Kelly? Okay, let the minutes reflect that the vote was 47 to 52, 47 upholding the chair's opinion, 52 against the chair's opinion. Let the minutes reflect that the precedent that has been in process at the state Republican Party regarding auxiliaries has changed for the first time in many years. Point of order. Those auxiliaries, would you please, uh, the auxiliaries, I'll name them, please surrender your credentials at this time. Point of order. Yes. Wait, I, I'm, I have a problem. Well, the Utah Federation of Republican Women, the Young Republicans of Utah, the Young Repu Utah Republican Latino Coalition, the Teenage Republicans, and the Utah Black Republicans.
Okay, now we have a motion before the body to approve the Point of order. minutes to the secretary's report. Yes. A complaint was filed with the NAP on October 16th, 2017, regarding this violation of our bylaws. That complaint was substantiated by the, the parliamentary and the parliamentarian reprimanded. And this is a quote from the NAP. Regarding retention of auxiliaries, in the, in the, the parliamentary of time, did in, in, not in, in advise the, the client of, and call the attention of the presiding officer the deviation of the rules that might ha be harmful to the organization. The respondent's uh, response and the script for handling of retention of auxiliaries did not support the requirement in the bylaws that a new auxiliary would have to be recommended by the executive committee for action to be taken by the state central committee. The ethics committee determines that the respondent did not act properly and the complaint is upheld. Therefore, the, the parliamentarian is hereby reprimanded for not providing alternate wording or acknowledging the possibility of no recommendation from the executive committee. Every auxiliary of the UTGOP as of today has not been approved by the SCC. Okay. I the, just wanted that to state for okay. the record that we aren't doing something that really is an arbitrary. Outside, that is an outside body. There was no objection made to that meeting. I think uh, Joe Levi spoke to this. There was no objection made at that meeting. That is something that happens in the past. When a parliamentary decision is made in a meeting, even though it may be incorrect, if it is done without an objection to the body and accepted at that point, but later on found to be an incorrect decision, you move forward with the understanding that you made an error in the past. But if you were to change that, for instance today, if we were to not acknowledge those auxiliaries who were credentialed at the last few meetings, now you would have to go back and, and start to discuss all those items that were voted on and, and revisit those as whether they were valid or not because of the people that were credentialed in those meetings. So we move forward from this point. So that statement uh, is not applicable to this body as far as the meaning or the, me the mention of that. Mr. Chair, I, I have a we are now on the auxiliaries, if I might. Uh, one of the, a member of one of the auxiliaries called me. I did receive the email uh, invite to the executive committee call that you referenced. It did have information about many of the auxiliaries. I don't know if it was all complete. But in there was the membership list, which must be 25 members. Uh, one of these members called me and told me that he had not signed up on this auxiliary, and then he emailed me confirmation that he was not aware he was on this auxiliary. This, this sounds like something that for the executive committee to discuss. And, and well, let's, if we're going to discuss forward. it here today, it was the Black Assembly. It appears to me it calls into question their whole list of names. If one person said, I was put on there without permission, I didn't know about this, and I emailed him, and he's present okay. today, I, yeah. would, I object to the consideration of the Black Assembly based on the grounds that their, their list seems to be... Uh, the veracity is it's, a question. It's not appropriate this time. They've been uncredentialed okay. at this point. Okay, I'll so wait then. Thank you. No, that, we have a motion on the floor. Uh, that, let, let's move the meeting forward. We could be here all night. Mr. If, Chair, uh, don't, this we have to like this. don't we have to re vote on the vote that was already taken? We have not. No, we did not. Because we, uncreden we took away the credentials of people who had voted no. on that vote. No, we do not re-vote on that item. We don't. Mr. Chairman. It doesn't make a material difference anyway. Mr. Chairman, in deference to the auxiliaries that are here today, I would recommend that I make a motion that we, uh, that we grant them speaking privileges in this meeting and, uh, until we get the, and, and do so until we get the executive committee for approval to recognize their important contribution to the party and make sure their voice is heard. Thank you. Okay, the motion on the floor, and, and uh, we'll get back to the secretary's motion. They were not removed. They did not remove them. They make the requirement. They're still credentialed. Grayson, can you confirm you're still credentialed? I'm not credentialed. He, he should be credentialed. So Grayson, no, I ask that he is credentialed, please. Not yet. We need to approve him today, Mr. Chair. He was recommended with unanimous consent from the executive I don't committee think there was to a, this body. Was that bylaw require a recommendation? I think it's just an approval from the executive committee that they're in compliance. Okay, recommends. Okay, we'll and, get to that. And we that did that. Eventually. We we recommended them. We'll get to um, that eventually at the auxiliary uh, portion, Grayson. You're this, not this is, right now. This is just a point that I would like to make as a member of the executive committee. I would ask that staff and leadership fast track the consideration of the auxiliaries that we just took care of today, so that we can hear them, and that we can approve those that meet those requirements as quickly as possible. I have a long drive to come all the way to Salt Lake to to attend those meetings, but I will commit to do that so that we can get 
more participation in and make sure that those auxiliaries meet our requirements. Thank you. So the motion on the floor is to allow the auxiliaries that are here in attendance, despite the fact that they do not have voting privileges, speaking privileges. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. They will be allowed to speak at today's meeting. The last motion on the floor is to add minutes to the secretary's presentation. All in favor of adding those minutes, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Okay, those will be added to the secretary's uh, report. Are there any other items for a discussion on the agenda? Yes, Chair. Yes. <coughs> Chair recognizes. Julie Edwards, Davis County. Um, I move that we, after the vice chair elections, go into executive session. For what purpose? <clears throat> so we can talk about things that happen in the executive session. So approve the for the previous minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, the motion on the floor is to go into executive session. Uh, can you say where that is, 7B or between 7B yeah, and 7C or 7A and 7B? It's, yeah, just right after vice chair election. Right after. Okay, executive. Do we need a reason? So you want to, uh, so not an executive session, that is something you'll motion for at that time, but you want to add a discussion item and you don't want Just that to, to be. Just to approve the minutes of the executive session in executive session. That's the way you have to do it, yeah. Per be on you, many of you have yeah. this motion. Well, that would be taken up when we actually do. That will be accomplished during the approval of the minutes. So you bring that up at that session, time. Yeah. Okay. So w once we approve uh, the minutes into the agenda, which we have, once we adopt the agenda, you can bring that point to order during those minute approval okay. portion of the meeting, okay? Thanks. Thank you. All right. Is Mr. there anything Chair. else to the agenda? Yes, Mr. Chair. I'd like to, uh, after approval of the agenda, uh, be able to talk about uh, voting rules and procedures well that's what I'm asking for okay where would you like it to be and what do you, would you like it to say uh, yeah just pre just so that it's before the elections we always already have rules discussion before the elections we'll discuss the rules okay. if you're okay with that yeah as long as we can talk about we'll discuss things that. to do with that that's great thank you point of information Nels Baxter in Utah County I want to know what will happen under the agenda item B, auxiliaries. The approval of one auxiliary, which is the uh, College Republicans. I move that we move it ahead of the vice chair um, election. So that. Okay, the motion on the floor is to move the auxiliary approval uh, in front of the vice chair elections. I assume that's so that Grayson can participate in the election? Yes. Okay, all in favor of that, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Okay, that is done, so 7A will now be the auxiliary approval. Parliamentary inquiry. Um, Mr. Chair, as I understand, the executive committee um, was had determined that they had a quorum and then that was determined that they don't have a quorum based on the credentials of the uh, auxiliaries which we just ruled were not valid. So I, I just wanted to determine, does that mean then that the executive committee did have a quorum based on their determination at the time?
Okay, the, uh, the point made by uh, Joe Levi uh, that a quorum was discussed and no objection was had at the EC meeting, therefore a quorum was available. Grayson Massey was approved at that. He will be approved today. Mr. Chairman, Kim Pickett, San Pete County. Yes. I move to call question on the agenda as it's been amended with the minutes included. Okay. With any amendments, so I call question the on question that at this time. The question has been called. The debate is uh, uh, to end the debate. It is a two-thirds majority required. All in favor of ending debate on the agenda and move to adopting the agenda, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. Okay, the ayes have it. The debate is ended. Uh, the motion on the floor is to adopt the agenda as modified. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. Okay, the, adoption, uh, the agenda is adopted. Hallelujah. Point of, point of clarification, Mr. Chair. Oh, I'm still on. Mr. Chair. Yes. Just to clarify, so the determination was that the executive committee did have a quorum at the time, and that's not in dispute anymore. It was not objected to at the time, so therefore it stands. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Chairman. <laughs> Sir. We're now to the chairman's report. I. Um, I'm Elizabeth Carlin from Weber County, and a point of information is that I never got a call to this meeting at all. Okay. I, I contacted staff, left messages on their phone, and this morning when I walked in, I said to one of the members of the staff, I've the party never secretary, gotten one. I'll let the party secretary and, speak to that. Okay, no, 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 I have a motion, and this is my motion. To accept you the a point secretary's you a point list. Of information first of all. So now you have a point of motion. Yes, I now okay. have a motion. Okay. Motion to accept the secretary's list of the state central committee for the official contact list of the Republican Party. Thank you. Okay. Could you please bring that forward? I didn't even understand that. Okay, the motion on the floor is that the secretary's list is the official contact list for the state central committee. All in favor, we can discuss this. Is there any discussion? Would you like to discuss this? Second. We've got a second. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, say no. Okay, that motion is approved. All right, the next item on the agenda is the chair reports. I would like to add a special thank you to Andrew Young back there for all the audio video equipment up here. Thank you, Andrew. He also did this at the uh, convention. He's, he's doing this free of charge, and, uh, and uh, we certainly appreciate this. If anyone wants a recording of this meeting, he will be able to provide that after the meeting. i also like to thank Scott Miller for the check-in. The more familiar we get with electronic check-in, the more we use it, the, the better the process becomes. I'd also like to send out a special thank you to the staff. May 8th, I left the country, and I got back yesterday, and uh, uh, it was a much-needed vacation for myself and my wife. They've asked me not to do that again. <laughs> uh, well, we went to, uh, uh, real quick, Copenhagen, Estonia, St. Petersburg, Helsinki, Stockholm. So we did a Baltic uh, uh, area tour. I'd also like to thank the parliamentarian uh, for her time coming out here and supporting us. As far as the uh, SCC, they're, they're a, 
Uh, I'd like to welcome Kathleen back to the SEC for your short sabbatical, and I also like to uh, welcome Nika Roundy as a, a new member of the SEC. Nika, welcome. As far as upcoming events, fundraisers are very important, and I found out that the chair really is a guy who stands on his knee with his hat in hand and begs for money, and uh, it's much like the guys that stand on the corner. Uh, I will say that the upcoming fundraisers we have planned, the first one that I'll mention is the governor is uh, supporting a fundraiser. What we are looking at doing is a dinner at the Hale Family Theater sponsoring a murder mystery and, and selling a plate, each plate with a limited amount of people at, attending of 100 people. That is going to be hosted by the Hale Family Theater owners, Mark and Sally Dietline. Uh, also, we have a uh, rifle, uh, well, a shooting competition. It's, it's more than rifle shooting competition that will be hosted by several uh, prominent area uh, gun experts, to include NRA uh, uh, personality Clark Apogian, and I'm not sure what position he holds there as the the vice president or president, but uh, he's going to help us out with that. Also, uh, Paige Marriott is going to do a capital. Uh, fundraiser at the Capitol Hill Club in D.C. for us at some point this year, and uh, we're looking forward to that as well. Up here, if you haven't already seen this, uh, I am, uh, you can, please don't call me Zebra, you can call me the chair, but I'm the referee in here. I want to make sure, and my only focus today is that the body is heard, that all rights are upheld, every individual in this room, and the rules are followed. Uh, I see posts all the time from social media warriors out there that are state that make statements, uh, and as though m the more you post, the more you make statements, the more it becomes true. That is not the case. Not any time when I see these posts do uh, I receive a phone call to clarify that information from a lot of these individuals. I want you to know that my phone is available and open, and I do answer my phone, and you can get that information clarified before you go on social media to start uh, igniting the fires of, of uh, contention. I want no one to leave today feeling that they've been unheard. There is no attempt by anyone today, uh, and if there is, I will step in at personal attacks. Uh, however, there will be some critical conversations going on. Those critical conversations should be directed towards the position uh, and not towards the individual. That concludes my remarks. Uh, also, there is a, the CDC, as far as the chair report, the CDC has asked that I allow uh, Mr. Shar? Cher. Cher to address us today. He was a contracted by the Constitutional Defense Committee to represent us with regards to our lawsuit. The chair recognizes Jean Shar, Cher, Cher, sorry, for 15 minutes. Mr. Chair, point of order really quick, just point of information, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Um, I'd just like to mention today is Armed Forces Day. So just uh, uh, like to make sure that we you. recognize our, our military in the room. So and everyone who's serving the forces, yeah, please stand and be recognized. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure for me to be with all of you today and, uh, and to be with a, uh, a Republican Party that is, uh, that is so successful. Um, my wife and I are active in Republican politics in Maryland, and uh, there's quite a contrast between, uh, between our level of success there and, uh, and your level of success in, uh, in electing Republican politicians both at the national level and, uh, and at the state level. So I think you're all to be commended for your wonderful work. Um, I am a native of Utah. I was born in Kanab and uh, was raised most, mostly in, uh, ra raised for much of my life, my early life in, uh, in the Rose Park area here in Salt Lake City and, uh, and then uh, and went to Brigham Young University as, a, as an undergraduate and, uh, and then went away to law school and, uh, and kind of became enamored with the idea that you could have a lawn that grows that you don't have to water. Um, and so. Uh, my, my wife and I uh, elected to stay uh, out on the East Coast with what became a very large family. We have seven children. 
but I, uh, I, I now fortunately have a foot back in Utah regularly and that I'm, a, I'm an adjunct professor at BYU Law School where I teach courses on constitutional law and uh, U.S. Supreme Court advocacy. Um, so I, uh, I, I very much appreciate my uh, continued close contacts with the state of Utah. Now, I, I've, I've been asked to share some thoughts about the, uh, the legal case involving SB 54, which, uh, which I'm honored to, uh, to be able to work on on, be, on your behalf. Now, at first blush, and you all are familiar, I'm sure, with that, uh, with that lawsuit and with the underlying legislation that's being challenged there, at first blush, when you look at that lawsuit, uh, people may be tempted to think that that lawsuit is all about the choice between the caucus convention system on the one hand and the petition system on the other uh, as a way of nominating candidates. Uh, and of course the immediate holding in the unfortunate opinion from the Tenth Circuit was, was to uphold SB 54 and, and thereby to force the party to accept a petition process as, as one route to a nomination. Um, but as the Chief Judge's dissent in that case uh, points out, the central issue in, in that lawsuit is really much deeper than the choice of how, how do we get nominees on the ballot. Uh, the, the central issue is really about the scope of the government's power to regulate core functions and even messages of a political party or indeed any voluntary expressive association under the First Amendment. And so the underlying issue is really a First Amendment issue. Um, and in that regard, I appreciated the prayer that was given earlier that, uh, that mentioned the First Amendment and its, and its protections. But that's really what's at stake is, uh, is, is the scope of the, uh, of the First Amendment's protection, not only for political parties, but for all kinds of voluntary associations. Um, and that could include anything from the, from the Boy Scouts to the neighborhood swim, swim club maybe, or, or to even churches. Um, and so the issues are, are very important. And, and in the course of upholding SB 54, uh, the, the Tenth Circuit majority uh, made two critical First Amendment holdings that we've challenged in a petition for rehearing by the full court. All 12 members of the Tenth Circuit, we've asked them to take a second look at the, uh, at the majority opinion. Um, and, and at the risk of being overly technical, let me just review for you what those two issues are. Um, uh, the first is, or the first holding that was made by the, uh, uh, the majority that we're challenging, was the holding that government's regulation of a party's mechanism for choosing candidates does not violate the First Amendment, even when the evidence shows that the purpose of the regulation was to influence the chosen candidate's substantive views and, and therefore the message of the party. Um, the second holding was a, was a more general holding about how we resolve First Amendment questions in, uh, in lawsuits and, and what the majority hold, and we've also challenged this, is that in determining the First Amendment impact of a regulation on a party or by extension any expressive association, uh, courts should examine the burden from the standpoint of the rank and file members, not from the standpoint of the institution as constituted by its internal regulations and bylaws. And we've had a lot of discussion in this meeting uh, about the importance of the party's constitution and bylaws. And so we all in this room, we understand how important those things are, and yet the Tenth Circuit majority sort of threw all that aside and, say, and said, no, we're going to look at the impact of this, of this government regulation based on our own speculation about how party rank and file members in general would feel about it. And, and, and consider for a, for a moment then the implications of that idea. If a court can ignore the views of a political party's duly constituted leadership in determining the impact of a government regulation, in favor of their own speculation on the views of the party's rank and file, what's to keep a court from taking that same approach in determining the impact of even more burdensome regulations on other expressive associations like, uh, like churches and service clubs? Imagine, for example, a federal law that said, you know, that all churches have to select um, for leadership positions and for ordination, men and women on the same terms as, as each other, right? So that, that would obviously be a direct affront, for example, to the Catholic faith, which, uh, which limits its priesthood to 
uh, to women. Um, or suppose there's a federal law that says, uh, that says all churches have to recognize same-sex marriages and opposite-sex marriages on the same terms, right? Just uh, imagine a law like that. And so the, the majority's approach would say, well, we're not going to really look at what the hierarchy in those organizations say or what the, you know, what the Constitution and bylaws or even, even the scriptures say about the issue. We're going to look at, the, look at it from the standpoint of ordinary members. And in the case of ordaining women, uh, you know, the court, might, the, the court might say, well, you know, we, we know first of all that, um, that at least half of Catholics are, are women, and so we don't think they're going to mind if women are ordained to the priesthood. And, uh, you know, and we, we look at opinion polls of what ordinary Catholics think about, uh, about that issue, and we think a, ma a clear majority of Catholics believe that it's, it would be just fine to, or, uh, you know, to ordain women. And so, and so they would conclude there's no First Amendment burden on the Catholic Church by a regulation or a law that, uh, that forces them. Uh, to ordain women to the priesthood, um, so it's a it, it's a very sweeping, in in my view, really really a, a, a broadside attack on some important First Amendment principles to to undertake the analysis that way. Um, so so for that and other reasons, uh, I believe this case is is a very important effort to vindicate uh, the F First Amendment rights, as I said earlier, not just of the Utah Republican Party, but of all expressive associations throughout the state uh, and throughout the Tenth Circuit. And of course, the Tenth Circuit includes the states of Colorado and New Mexico and Arkansas and Oklahoma and others. So it's a big a big chunk of the country where, in my view, First Amendment rights are are under attack. Uh, by this majority opinion. Uh, let me just say a word about the process for the case going forward. We have already, as you know, uh, filed a petition for rehearing or in the alternative for rehearing on banc. That means in, if, the, if the panel doesn't grant us relief, and I don't suspect they will, then we're asking the entire court, all 12 active members of the court, to reverse the panel. So we filed that petition on April 18th. Um, and the court then ordered uh, the state to file a response, which is, uh, which is relatively unusual and indicated that there's some interest uh, within the Tenth Circuit in our, in our petition. And, the, and then the state filed its response on May 15th. Um, and, and ironically, the state's response um, actually suggests that the party nomination process is really uh, the state's own process, um, suggesting that the party itself is in some sense an arm of the state rather than a truly private organization. And, and when you look at it, that, that's, to me, that seems like the underlying mistake in the majority's opinion and, and to some extent the underlying mistake in the views of those who, um, who have been pressing this issue for a long time is they, they, they tend to view the party as, in a sense, an arm of the state rather than, a, the, rather than the truly private, voluntary organization uh, that it is. Um, so we will be, we'll be filing a reply in support of our petition uh, next week by, uh, um, by May 23rd. Uh, now, if, if the Tenth Circuit grants rehearing on Bonk, that'll be wonderful. They will probably have, uh, they will probably have re-argument in the case before all, the tw all 12 active judges, again, if they grant our petition. Um, if they don't grant the petition, we are hoping that there will be a vigorous dissent uh, from not just Judge Timkovich, who was the who was the dissenter, but also from other members of the Tenth Circuit, who will basically, we hope, tell the U.S. Supreme Court, we think you ought to take this case, and we, and you think and we think you ought to clear this mess up, uh, because to to some extent, the problem in the litigation is that there's there's some ambiguity in prior Supreme Court decisions. There's a, there's there's language in prior court decisions that the uh, that the majority was able to seize on. I think they misinterpreted it but they were able to seize on some language from prior Supreme Court decisions to justify their results. So hopefully, at a minimum, we will get a very strong statement from not just one, but a number of Tenth Circuit judges telling the Supreme Court, you ought to take this case uh, and, uh, and decide this issue on a nationwide basis. So if the, if the Tenth Circuit denies rehearing, just as a procedural matter, we'll have 90 days to file what's known as a, as a petition for a writ of certiorari, which is a petition that basically asks the Supreme Court to, to take this case over and decide it themselves. Um, and, and it will then take anywhere from two to four months for the Supreme Court to decide whether to take the case. And if they agree, if they grant our petition and agree to hear the case on the merits, 
uh, it will then take anywhere from six to 12 more months for the, for the court to, to conclusively resolve the case. Uh, so that's the process in a nutshell, and I'm happy to take questions from those who have questions. Three minutes left. Yes, sir. So Correct. Do we expect other organizations to join an amicus brief? So what's the Yes, we do. And in fact, we uh, we had we had one amicus brief that was filed in support of our petition for rehearing already in the Tenth Circuit. And and certainly certainly if if we end up going to the Supreme Court because we lose before the Tenth Circuit, we'll have we'll have other organizations that'll join with us. And is there a process for it's it's very informal, but that's you know that's one of the things that I've been retained to do is to uh, is to engage in that kind of recruiting. So you know if any of you have ideas of groups that might be interested in supporting us if we get that far, please let me know. Yes, sir. You mentioned uh, the state's position, and basically the state becomes lost is being able to tell everybody else how they're going to vote. In a sense, is that what I'm understanding? Well, they the. They, they, they claim the right to, um, to interfere with the, with, with the selection processes of political parties in a way so as to sort of push the party towards candidates that the state thinks will be better for the state. No, that's exactly right, and I think as, as a matter of principle, it would be wise for the Democratic Party to be to be with us on this uh, on this issue. So far, they've not been. Have you but talked with them on that? Because it, it seems to me that the way this this has gone about from the state side of the thing is is arguing that they have carte blanche over telling you what what way we're going to vote in the state, and it doesn't matter, you know, one way or another how you feel about it. Well, they 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 are. Our, they are taking a very broad view of the state's authority, but your 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 idea of checking with some folks at the in, at the Democratic Party and see if they would change their minds and support us is a good one, and we'll uh, we'll follow up on that. Any other questions? Yes, Jean. Hi, Sherilyn yes. Bacon. Hi. Eager. Hi, Thank Sherilyn. you so much good for being you. here with us and for what you're doing. Um, I am curious to know that if we do win this, whether at the circuit court level or beyond to the Supreme Court, um, if this could have an impact on the other states that have desired to change their system, they lost their caucus system years ago, uh, and if this could be used to reverse those trends in other states that I've been in touch with that want to get the caucus I, back. It, 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 certain, it certainly could have that effect if we were to win. Yes. So, thank you all. Thank you, Gene. Safe travels back to uh, D.C. Let the minutes also reflect that the chair has not been involved in any contract uh, discussions or negotiations on behalf of the party with Mr. Chair. The budget, in accordance with our bylaws, the budget is required to be approved at this meeting. A uh, budget was not provided nor noticed at the meeting, therefore it will not be considered at this meeting. Another item of concern I know of many people in this room is the uh, bylaws submitted to the Lieutenant Governor's Office in February. At the February 24th, 2018 SEC meeting, a number of bylaw changes were adopted. Under state law, updated documents will be sent to the Lieutenant Governor's Office at a prescribed time frame. The chair, as the liaison with the, gov with the uh, lieutenant governor's office, timely submitted this document, as did, incidentally, 15 other people in this room. <laughs> At the February meeting, legal counsel advised the members of the potential harm contained in the submitted language. The SEC debated and amended, amended this proposed language several times. Prior to filing the bylaws with the lieutenant governor's office, the chair requested a final review by legal counsel, and certain provisions were found to be contrary to state law and could adversely affect the standing of the party and its candidates, meaning the elephant would no longer be under their name or next to their name at the November ballot. In addition, under Robert's Rules of Order, page 111, it states, no main motion is an order that conflicts with the corporate, corporate charter, constitution, or bylaw, and to the extent 
that procedural rules apply with an organization or assembly are prescribed by federal, state, local law, no main motion is in order that conflicts with such rules. Therefore, it will be declared null and void. Page three and four of Robert's Rules of Order. Aside from the rules of parliamentary procedure and the particular rules of an assembly, any actions of a deliberative body are also subject to the applicable procedural rules prescribed by local, state, national law and would be null and void if in violation of such law. Robert's Rules of Order, page 343. Motions that conflict with the corporate charter, constitution, or bylaws of society within the procedural rules prescribed by a nation, state, or local laws are out of order. And if any motion of this kind is adopted, it is null and void. In addition, as chair of your party, I have a fiduciary responsibility to protect the organization from harm, whether from without or within. Under penalty of law, the chair is bound to provide, uh, to serve in a prudent and lawful manner. Upon the advice of both legal counsel and under our parliamentary authority, the language in question was removed to the bylaw before submission to the Lieutenant Governor's office. Mr. Chair. Second of all, the bylaw proposal requiring officers to break the law. There were a number of constitutional and bylaw proposals filed by the deadline for inclusion at this state central committee meeting. The re re review process with the CME committee, some sponsors pulled their submissions. What went out with the call to the SCC meetings were those that had been reviewed by the CME committee and were being forwarded to the sponsor, by the sponsors to the meeting. One submission included language that required the party, chair, and or officers to disregard existing state or federal law. Upon, up under our parliamentary authority, which I've discussed ad nauseum, no organization can knowingly pass a bylaw provision that would conflict with existing state or federal laws. If such provision were to occur in the governing documents, the provision would be declared null and void to the extent that it conflicts with the law. No provision can be adopted that would force an officer or another member to commit a violation of laws under which the organization is structured. Therefore, one submission has been put forward to the extent it does not violate the fundamental principles of parliamentary law and state or federal laws. If you do not like the law, you must petition the legislature to change the law. The chair recognizes Fred Cox. Thank you, Fred Cox, Salt Lake County. I just wanted to point out that the uh, bylaw 8.0 that was submitted to the state had elements from the February um, bylaw uh, vote and it removed items that were part of that vote and that had been in our bylaws back to 2015. And that obviously has a lot of concerns. In my particular race, it could have had dramatic impact because uh, the individual that I was running against uh, did not fill out the, the required paperwork. That required paperwork would not have been required under what we passed but what you submitted, it was required, but there was no teeth, and the forms that were filled out would have, did not match uh, either version of the bylaw. And so it, it kind of created a mess, and so uh, I just wanted to point that out, is okay. 8.0, as what was submitted to the state, doesn't exist anywhere uh, in our current bylaws as far as before uh, the February meeting or after, and I just, uh, that should be fixed. Thank you. Uh, the chair recommends that uh, we discuss that afterward, and if there's a bylaw change that we need to modify and address, we'll do so at such time. But thank you for your input. Point also, uh, this is during the chair remarks. If you'd like to bring us up during the later event. What's that? Okay, Janice, what do you have? Okay, what I, I would like to say is we have clauses in our Constitution that says severability. If any portion of this Constitution is ever declared void, all other portions shall remain binding and effective. There was no reason for the chair and a parliamentarian and a, leg, uh, and a attorney to go in and, and take things out of our bylaws that were duly adopted by the body. The, chan the way that it should have been done was a meeting called and had the body this body that could approve those changes make the changes. Additionally, I would suggest to you that there were attorneys on the other side that were working with that document and with that bylaw that stated that it was not against the law, that it was fine the way it was written. So it was your attorney, Stuart Pay, 
versus several others that disagreed okay. with him. And, that's, and Janice, that's number one. And, and okay. when, that, when that proposal was proposed, they stood up there in front of the room and they said, we want this lawsuit. We want this lawsuit to begin. And so it was a violation of the law by their own admission by saying Point that. of order. So. That was an executive session, okay. Mr. Chair. Secondly, the section that you're talking about on our bylaws that have been submitted through the CBC that should have gone forward today would have resolved that issue, and you took them out without permission from the submitter or from the CBC committee. The, we for have forward those, and so that needs to be replaced back in when we address that okay. bylaw. Under the advice of the parliamentarian, we cannot pass a bylaw that forces the officers to violate the, the law. The parliamentarian is not the one that makes the decision. This body is. I don't, dis I don't disagree with you. I don't disagree with you. Okay. However, when, when the body acts outside the law, you, that you can't. That is to be determined. And I think that the person, no, wait a minute. I think that the person that submitted that has an exp explanation for what was supposed to be done with that. And it, it, the explanation makes good sense. Okay. And you have not even put it in there. I think it needs to be addressed. Thank you. So the next Mr. item. Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is during the chairman's order. report. Let's continue the meeting. Mr. Chairman, we need to remember we have, we have received bad parliamentarian advice as, as shown by the NAP complaint. We have received bad that, advice. That NAP complaint is under uh, appeal at this time, so we'll wait for the appeal to process itself as well. Next, the chairman has decided to uh, form a caucus task force. The CTF is comprised of, of five initial members, and then there's a group of probably 30 people who volunteered when the survey was sent out who are involved in this. And uh, without taking their thunder, the chair now recognizes uh, Weldon. Is Weldon here? Weldon, come on up. And he'll discuss uh, some things and answer some questions you may have regarding this. Uh, the whole philosophy behind this is to strengthen the caucus system and modernize it. They called each other this morning to coordinate. I showed up at work one day earlier this week, and my boss was wearing the same shirt as me. I said, well, one of us is going to have to go home and change. He said, well, you can go home and change, but I'm not going to pay you while you're doing it. Well, it's not going to work then. So we're going to change gears uh, a little bit, at least for a few minutes here. Uh, read something out. We've, uh, we've put together a charter. I started out by calling it a mission statement until somebody else in the, in the group pointed out that it got much too big for that. A mission statement should be a whole lot shorter. So I'm going to read that uh, just to kind of introduce what we're going to be doing and what our focus will be. The Republican Party is a party by the people and for the people. We appreciate the productivity of our citizens, affirm the infinite worth of all individuals, and seek the best possible quality of life for all. We invite all citizens to join us in working together for a better Utah. I uh, hope we all recognize that. That is from the party platform, available on our website. Uh, it's more about us. The caucus task force has been created to analyze the entirety of Utah's caucus and convention system collect and coordinate feedback from party membership at large, and present our findings and action recommendations to the State Central Committee at their regular quarterly meetings. Uh, as this is the first of those quarterly meetings, we don't have any action recommendations or findings at this point. We're just kind of saying hi to everybody and starting to make some calls to say hello. The reasons people give for not being active in the caucus process covered a very broad spectrum of personal life, work, religious commitments, and other circumstances. There is no single solution that will resolve all of the issues and lead to increased attendance. So we expect this process will take some time to thoroughly collect and review feedback from throughout the state and work together to determine which practices to recommend. Our sincere hope is that the results of our work to support the State Central Committee in this endeavor will be increased voter participation and confidence in the caucus system 
and an increase in appreciation both for the caucus itself, oh, both for the caucus and convention system itself, and for those public servants who so passionately endeavor to protect and promote this system. Uh, now, the most important part to us, we intend to approach our efforts to enhance the caucus and convention system without concerning ourselves with any issues relating to the SB 54 lawsuit, count my vote initiative, keep my voice initiative, or any other initiative or legal battles. Whether the caucus is the only path to the ballot or one of many, we cannot expect to increase attendance and participation in the system by force or by manipulation, but only by appealing to the free will of prospective attendees throughout the state. We invite all interested parties to join us in our efforts to bring the caucus system into the modern age and develop it into the gold standard among all possible and available options for candidates to interact with the party and to be placed on the ballot for the general public. And that's uh, me, Weldon Hathaway, Shelley Clough, Aaron Madsen, Nathan Whiting, and Travis Hoban. As Rob had mentioned, we started off. Any questions? Yeah. I'm sorry I don't know very many names yet, but I <laughs> Cheryl and Bacon Eager, yes. thank you for doing this. Um, oh, I think it was about five years ago. I can't remember if it was Thomas or James, one of the two. Um, a committee was formed, and members of the SEC were allowed to, um, you know, volunteer to be involved. And I would like to see a little of that, maybe, if there's some more that would like to be part of this committee, if that would be appropriate. And also, I hope you will um, get a copy of our notes and all of the discussion that we had. It took a whole lot of time from to before? put that together okay. from that prior committee. If that, that would be, be fantastic. All right. Yeah, um, as Rob had mentioned, we have, there's the five of us that are kind of leading things off. And we're trying to kind of get things started a little slowly on purpose because we're trying to reach out, uh, get a bunch of people involved. We have uh, Sam Parker who is one of our recent Senate candidates. He is involved in the body of the committee. Uh, he's been sharing some, uh, some information he's already collected from a survey that he sent out. We've been going through that. Uh, Alicia Colvin, another Senate candidate, is there with us. Um, Josh Daniels uh, from Utah County is there. Aaron's here. Aaron Bowen's part of our, our committee group. So anyone who would like to provide information or already has data or anything that can help in any way, We'll take everything that we can get and do our best to digest and work with it. I'm just wondering, what does it take to be a, to volunteer to be a part of that committee? I know I responded and said I'd like to be a part of that committee when it was when it was put forth forth in what Rob sent out to everybody or the chairman sent out to everyone, but I didn't hear anything back. Uh, you just did volunteer. What's your name? Tina Horlocker. <laughs> what was it again? Sorry. Well, Give it again. Tina Horlocker. Oh, Tina. Yes, we'd love to have your input. Um, if anybody else had submitted and said, hey, I want to be part of this, and I haven't reached out, that is entirely my fault. Rob gave me a list of everyone who had said, hey, I'm interested in, in helping with this effort. I got a hold of a few of those people, and then he continued to add to that list, and I have failed to look at it to see other names that were added as they came in. So we got started. We got a few people involved, and people started reaching out to folks that they already knew. And then I failed to look at that list again. So My I will definitely be reaching out, and I will look at that list again. So if you send in an email and said, I'd like to help, and you haven't heard from us yet, I will take care of that. OK, I, I think I responded in like three minutes of having him sent the email out. So I should have been like at the very top. But I would really like to be a part of that committee. OK, yeah, I'd love to have your help, Tina. Who else? Hands, questions? Yes. I certainly hope so. I don't know how many rural folks we have on there currently. Oh, Nathan, yeah, we were going to have dinner last night. And then Nathan called up and said, hey, I'm not going to be able to make it because I have to do a C-section on a cow. So, you know, Nathan's work emergencies are a little different from some of our other work emergencies. And so I said, yeah, I hope so. I, I, the next step, like so far up to this point, all we've done is collect information that people already have. Like Sam had already done this survey where he asked, uh, his last question was, you know, what would you do to improve the caucus and convention system? So we've just been looking through that and just kind of seeing the kind of responses that we get from people. 
Uh, one person had suggested we'd like to have representatives come out and participate in like a high school class or assembly. That's an idea I had never thought of before or that had occurred to me. They said you ought to come out and get involved with high school seniors more and get in their civics classes and do assemblies and things like that. And maybe even have some of these high school students come out and help run caucus night. That hadn't run across my radar before. Some people probably have heard it. So remote areas, yes. The next step after this is I'm going to be reaching out to all of the county chairs and vice chairs to try and get more information about how many precincts they have, how the attendance in each individual precinct is, contact information for precinct chairs. We might have ideas for Emory County and how they hold their caucus and how they organize and run that that are different from Salt Lake and Utah County. That's the sort of thing that we're trying to collect and then bring back and recommend. You know, we aren't taking any action. We're just a recommending group. So we will collect information, we'll put it together, and then we will come to this body and recommend what we think might be good ideas based on that information that comes in. Is there any way you can please post your meeting dates and times on the state party website? At least a Our week, meetings? At least a week in advance, so that those of us who might be interested in coming. Uh, or send it out via email or something. If we start having any type of official meeting, our, our main thing initially right now is just going to be getting on the phone. You know, I'm going to be calling county chairs and talking to them one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. you know, all over the place. As far as having like an official meeting with our group, I, I don't expect that that will happen like in person. As I said, we're going to be really spread out all over the place. If we have an official meeting of the, of the caucus task force, love to have as many people who want to attend show up. So we would definitely be more than happy to post about that and have people come. Okay, yep. thank you. Oh, sorry. Hi, Two Leah. microphones. I got to look both ways. Leah Hansen, Utah County. Um, I really love the idea of a caucus task force um, and how you're trying to go at things slowly and to uh, to differentiate yourself, I guess, from from keep my voice and count my votes and, and all those kinds of task forces. What will um, keep you guys independent in a manner of speaking and not have not not being so heavily influenced by the external? Uh, I think. What, what we're trying to accomplish, I think we all observed this at the, at the state convention. There was a lot of things that we were arguing about. There were a lot of disputes and there were a lot of differences of opinion on just trying to get the agenda adopted. The one place where we very clearly all of us agreed was let's set aside the argument stuff and work on nominating candidates. And that was received with thunderous applause. The caucus task force is going to be very similar. We're going to say, you know, no matter what happens, if keep my voice defeats count my vote, then we'll, we'll respond to that. We'll figure out how to make the caucus work better under that scenario. If count my vote passes, if SB 54 is revoked or repealed or upheld, or whatever happens with all of those things, we will continue to reach out to people across the state and figure out how to make the caucus system work better regardless of what else is going on. Because what's currently happening is people for a wide variety of reasons just feel like the caucus isn't working for them and we want to find out what those reasons are and then work together to overcome whatever those obstacles are and get them back out to those meetings. That's best. So, um, I just wanted to offer some maybe uh, I guess my personal opinion, but some guidance to the caucus task force yeah. as a, the Republican Party caucus task force. First of all, as Republicans, we, we uh, support the idea of a republic as opposed to a democracy. And uh, when we talk about modernizing the caucus system, I just have a couple of concerns that I don't want to get lost in, in the, uh, the effort of what seems like a good idea at the time. So uh, the obvious downsides of democracy, is, as I hope are understand by most people in this room, are that mob rule takes place and it's easy to, to get the the whims of the masses versus, you know, a, a selected group of elected representatives as, as the caucus system uh, encourages and supports. Caucus is defined as a meeting at which local members of political party register their preference among candidates or select delegates to attend a convention or definition to a conference of members 
or a legislative body who belong to a particular party or faction. Synonyms meeting, assembly, gathering, congress, conference, convention, rally, convention. All centered around the idea of meeting, gathering, people in the same room together. And I think when we talk about modernizing that, the thing that comes to my mind is going to a route of where people can participate without actually being present. And I think that that greatly dilutes the process of the system. There's been other counties that have experimented with electronic voting where people could vote at a caucus that they didn't attend and unable to participate in the discussion in those meetings we're not able to participate in, in what occurred there. And so my, my concern is just that we don't move towards modernizing it into a situation where we exit the purpose of the caucus, which is to bring those within interest together, have a discussion, rather than just survey the opinions of everybody, because that's democracy. Yeah, and, and I appreciate that. And I totally and completely agree with you about getting people together for this. I love the feedback. It's not about me. And I agree with you, and I appreciate it. What we're trying to do is get, you know, this same kind of feedback from everyone so that I can come back to this, well, probably not this exact same room. We all know it was a little pricey. Uh, but this same group of people and decide on what's going to work best for the party going forward. So, again, you know, my opinion, I'm just here to be sort of a facilitator for the group, have everybody come in and offer whatever they think is going to work best for them and then present that to this body and have this body make that decision. I'm not a decision maker. I'm just a feedback provider to this group. So thank you. Thanks. One more question with the man with the really awesome quick, shirt. Really quick, not really a question. Uh, Chris oh. Boot, chair of Cache County. Uh, oh, yeah. And um, well, and I've had email exchanges um, about this committee. I just wanted to let you know that as far as Cache County goes, and, you know, we've reached out to, to Weldon and, the other night at our executive committee meeting the other night, uh, we, our executive committee unanimously approved uh, our own caucus task force up there in, Co in Cache County to, uh, to help this effort right here. Um, because we have, you know, Nate Whiting is from Cache County. He's on this as the outreach, and we want to be able to help provide that feedback. So I just want to say it's, it's really easy to get a hold of Weldon and, you know, and, and do that. And I encourage, you know, especially the rural counties um, where they feel like a voice might be getting lost or whatever. To, to reach out and, and to help us out in this effort. All right, thank you. Great idea, and I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Thanks Weldon, for coming in. And, and uh, uh, the f five people that uh, uh, Weldon is, is, is part of, the, the committee itself, have, have delineated responsibilities. But uh, the group that they communicate with is much larger than that. We'll include the SCC in the emails and the meetings. Uh, really, what my only charter to Weldon was, I need you to have some findings, some conclusions, and uh, some recommendations to this body going forward to strengthen our caucus system. For instance, and my one complaint that I think I vocalized with him is, uh, there was a deadline for state convention delegates to the state on Monday at 5 p.m. There was one county that we didn't have any state delegates in, until that deadline. And so the turnaround time on delegate reporting and information out to our candidates so they can actually campaign needs to be better. And so that's, those are some of the things they're looking at. Uh, that concludes the chair's report. Next on the agenda is the secretary. Well, hello. I didn't know I was going to be giving. Oh, thanks, sweet. I didn't know I was going to be giving a report today because I wasn't on the first agenda. But thank you, Rob, for including me on the agenda. And uh, there's an elephant in the room, and I'm going to address that today. But I wanted to, since I had the opportunity, I first wanted to say that I am looking forward to this next year working with Rob, our new vice chair, and Abe, and bringing forward some unity and us to be able to be a very productive state central committee. I'm greatly looking forward to our primaries, and I love the process of how we got our candidates nominated. Don't you love that too? We just had, we had a great convention, and uh, despite what some of the, uh, what Weldon, wherever Weldon went, some of the things that he said, uh, we did come to some conclusions together as a, as a state convention, and I'm grateful that the delegates stuck with us on that. So I would hope that each of us as state central committee members, we are the leaders of our party, we are the governing body. Please, please go and find one of your candidates for the primary and help them. 
pick your choice. If you have neutrality, then you have to deal with that. But some of us don't have neutrality. I do. But some of the rest of us don't. Please go help your favorite candidates. Okay, so this elephant in the room that I'd like to address, first of all. I say that because I spoke at the convention and I had no intention to. And I just wanted to say, I quickly jotted this down. I heard somebody say, shh, they want to hear. <laughs> um, while many of us differ on the ruling of the chair pro tem, I'd like to remind the body, like the chair did earlier, that this was the first year since, I believe, 2005, when that bylaw was adopted, to go outside of the precedence of applying a bylaw in our process. I chose not to talk with any other media as what was put in my face that day at the meeting uh, caught me off guard in the heat of the moment. And I chose not to talk to anybody except for Lee Davidson, I believe it was, and I think he's here today. I think he introduced himself to me. And what I told him when he wanted to know, I said, I believe that there was a misunderstanding going on. And, and that I actually, Lee, I never read your article, if you're here. I never watched any of anything that I was filmed in except for what a delegate filmed. And I got to see what I actually said that day. So I could get into the nitty-gritties if you'd like me to, and I could tell you some of the things that I was going to share. But I think in the end, if anybody wants to challenge anything that I would have to say, I have audio recordings and other, other record that would support that it was the understanding that the Constitution Bylaws Committee Chair would actually have all of the forwarded emails that would support the, tra the transmission dates so that we could verify that they would have, that would happen. Um, I got that information from the chairman on March 29th, and I appreciated the conversation with him, but in the end, I think there was a great misunderstanding, and I think everybody was telling the truth from what they knew the truth to be. So if I could ask us to please come together and take away from the convention that we need to follow process and that we need to take care of each other. After the convention, the chair and I uh, started a process together because I contacted him and I said, the Constitution, Article 12, Section J, I believe it is, uh, tells the secretary to do a report and that report is of the state convention and our nominating process of who we nominated, who we sent forward. And uh, as I reached out, the chairman asked me to send the report to him and to uh, our parliamentarian, and I did. And then he informed me that the laws changed. So after that, I informed the Constitution Bylaws Committee chair that that article actually is null and it needs to be modified. I guess that's the best way to put it. And uh, that is the one, that's the one that has the direct direction to the secretary to, uh, to submit that to the lieutenant governor. So that's where I, where I understood that the secretary had some authority to send to the lieutenant governor. But I do recognize that the bylaws and the constitution do direct that we have a liaison that is appointed from our party, and that is why we work together to make sure that the lieutenant governor got the report. So that week after the convention, I spent that week contacting many, almost every one of you counties myself. I had a couple helpers, and thank you for giving me the information. I appreciate that. We submitted the report, and and I'm just waiting to hear the finalization, uh, what happened with that. Everyone, your candidate should be on the ballot. And if it's not, it's because uh, you didn't tell me. But that I think there's there. they're there. So I don't want to make you scared. So I just wanted to tell you, but that is what I love to do. I love to work with you. I like to get the results. I like to turn them in. That's the process that I love. So I want to talk about the minutes since I have this opportunity. Just make sure I didn't miss anything here. Uh, the minutes. So I've produced transcripts for the minutes that I have. I've listened to these meetings over and over and over and over and over again. And with headphones, out loud, anything I could to get the exact words. And uh, I, can't, I can tell you that I know exactly what you said when you said it in these meetings. And uh, that's just how, how strange it is for me. I spent over 80 hours on some sets of these minutes and at a minimum 40 hours on some of the other sets. And as you heard today, which I was really excited about, a huge smile to my face, the chairman used the minutes to support actions that happened in a meeting. That is what they're for. And so I hope today that we will approve those, this, a formal approval, any corrections, so I haven't received corrections yet. So you can always submit corrections. Uh, my last topic that I wanted to say, let's talk about mob rule. 
Someone mentioned at the convention that I had a Facebook post about mob rule. I believe I did, but I believe I was talking about a democracy, and I still can't find that, that post. But I know exactly what I was talking about. When we have a process that has a, goes through a refiner's fire, for instance, I live in Legislative 661. If I wanted to change the law, I have to go to my representative and suggest something, and he's got a long process to go through to get that to the floor of, of the Utah House or, or my Senate, right? And uh, if that's a beautiful process. We have it for a reason. It's called a republic. And that is what I was talking about with mob rule. I firmly believe in a republic. Our party's governance is modeled as a republic. A state central committee member, if you have a delegate or someone in your, your district that wants you to come and bring a bylaw, you can do that. We don't have to have them just wait until the convention. So that is what I talk about with that. The refiner's fire is called process. It goes through the rules committee, it goes, I'm talking about the legislature, and it goes to the other standing committees, and they determine and then bring it to the floor. And that is what our bylaw committee does. It determines where it's going. So I'm sure we'll be addressing that one. My last comment is good luck to all the vice chair candidates, and thank you for being willing to serve with us. Thank you. This is where the minutes are to be presented. Motion to approve the minutes. Second. Motion is to approve the minutes as uh, sent out. Are there any corrections? Uh, has anyone submitted any corrections? The chair recognizes Vint. Vint Gross, San Juan County. I just noticed that the, I noticed last night, and I apologize, I didn't have time to send this in but the January 27th meeting minutes, there are some items that were left off. Um, I'm happy to address those after, but the minutes as they are right now are not complete. Happy to address it now if you want me to. What's that? Do you want to address I can. Yeah, bring, bring, them up, bring them up now. We can't approve them without Vint, so could you address those? I can. Well, at the beginning of that meeting, it's not noted in the minutes we have. But at the beginning of that meeting, there was a rule made by yourself, the chair, stating that we were going to use microphones, but they would not be at stands at the front as we traditionally had done, but rather the chair would recognize an individual member and the microphone would be taken to them. It then, it's then noted on the first page that, uh, as I remember correctly, Lane Beck was recognized by the chair and began to make a a motion, but he left his seat and came to the forward to the front of the room at the end of one of the aisles. And at that point, decorum was called. Uh, it was noted that that was out of order because the rule had been that you were supposed to be at your seat. And the motion or the whatever it was Lane was speaking to, that item appeared to be the issue that everyone focused on rather than the fact that the rules we had set up at the first of the meeting were not being followed. That's my understanding is that's why decorum was called. And so none of that is reflected in here, but that's what happened at the meeting. So I just feel like that's important enough. It should be in the minutes because that is what happened. Okay. And the, and the numbers were more named. Were they named in the minutes? Okay. Thank you. All right. Is that the only change? Are there any other changes to the minutes before the body? Okay. If there, if there are no other changes. What did you want that was not in there? Did you want that uh, the, the member was out of his seat and, and came to the, what, what do you, well, at the what very do you want beginning, specifically? At the very beginning. Um, Give us the exact language so that we can put that in there and vote on that. Right after the noted credentials, the 129 state central committee representatives were credentialed. There should be something to the effect about the new rule with the microphones. That's not noted anywhere here. Um, later on, when we get to appeal the decision of the chair, I'm trying to remember exactly where it says this. Yeah, there's a piece there where it says the chair did not recognize the motion, call for decorum, 
Lane, named Lane Beck and advised the body that the next time he named someone, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the call for decorum, as I understood it, was because the rule about the microphone was not being followed. The member had actually approached the front of the room, had left his position at his chair. That's the reason it was out of order. That was the call for decorum. Had nothing necessarily to do with what he was talking about. We had breached decorum by not following the rules as far as the microphone use. That's the way I understood it, and that's the way those around me understood it. That's not reflected in here. And so the way it reads, it sounds like the issue was only what Mr. Beck was speaking to rather than the fact that the rules established right at the first of the meeting were not being followed right at the first of the meeting. Mr. Chair, yes. there was never a rule about when yeah. we're voted on by this body. This is not even okay, part so of the Okay, so the decorum would have been that uh, Mr. Beck came up and turned around and faced the audience and didn't face the chair. And, and uh, when the decorum call was made, continued to speak at that point. And then other members joined him. Is that something that you, you want reflected in the minutes? Uh, yeah, I want the, the fact that the, the issue about the decorum was more to do with the microphone than necessarily the subject matter that was being discussed. Okay. Right now, the minutes appear to reflect it was the subject matter. There's nothing about the fact that the rules established with microphone use was not being followed. Sir? Sir, yeah, he's included me in the people around him. He was sitting right next to me. I don't think we ever had a rule like that. I certainly did not agree with him on that point. And I, he included me saying the people around me, and I'm telling you, I was right next to him, this is and I was not. I hear you. Thank you. And You're welcome. argumentative. We could go on all day about he said, she said. Let's get to the matter. I take it back. Yeah. That part. In the interest of time, I, I understand the need to have the minutes to, to be as accurate as possible, but yeah. is this material? Is it going to change anything? No. And I don't think so. And so in the interest of time, unless somebody has something to contribute that actually is going to change the outcome, then maybe we could refrain from you know these minutia kind of comments. Being one of the members of this body that travels five hours to get here and five hours to go home, I find that comment humorous, but I agree that's immaterial to a degree. However, the minutes don't reflect what actually happened. They're incomplete. I'm just asking that they be completed with those comments. Mr. Chair. Okay. There, there's been no dispute to the correction of the minutes. Is, is, uh, is anyone want to argue against correcting the minutes to, to exclude what Vint wants to have in the minutes? Why don't we add some exact wording? May I make a suggestion? Um, after um, the chair did not recognize the motion called for decorum after Mr. Beck moved to the front of the room, would that be appropriate to insert that? And address the body. And, and turn and face the body and address yes. the body. Would that be appropriate wording? Would that be acceptable, Vin? Okay, Vin's fine with That's that. That's my well, motion. Second. Okay, the motion on the floor is, go ahead, Vin. I just think it needs to also state up front that we had a rule that was stated that that's how microphones would be used this meeting, and it was different than we had done before. That's all. Okay. Okay, so the motion on the floor is that the accurate, the, the uh, minutes reflect that, that uh, Mr. Beck approached the audience uh, when the call for decorum still turn, face the body, and, and address the body. Uh, all in favor of that being added to the minutes, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. No. Okay, uh, the ayes have it. As Mr. Chair, as, I, yes, I move Kim. we call question on adopting the minutes as, as amended. Okay. Kim Pickett, the question is been, Thank you, Kim. The question has been called on the adoption of minutes. Uh, that takes a two-thirds majority to stop debate on this. All in favor? Uh, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Okay, that motion uh, passes. The debate is ended. Now the motion is to approve the minutes as provided in the call. All in favor, please, as amended. As amended. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, say no. Okay, the minutes are approved. Thank heaven.
actionable item? It can be approved already. Is it actions or is it just simply discussion? Okay. Okay, the uh, Secretary has requested that we go into executive session to discuss executive minutes at this point. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Let me uh, back up again. Uh, generally speaking, from executive minutes meetings, things that are actionable are carried outside and recorded in the regular minute minutes. Anything that uh, accomplished or is done in within the meeting uh, is accessible to those people who, who request that. So uh, if it was actionable, it should be recorded in the normal minutes. Uh, all in favor, again, of going to executive session, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, say no. Okay, the ayes have it. Uh, we'll go into executive Mr. session. Chair, point of order please, on that. everyone uh, who is not credentialed, please leave. Mr. Chair, I, I, I thought there was a motion to add to the uh, agenda after the elections that we'd go into closed sessions, so that we could go through the elections first. So no, I, I, this is the, this is minutes approval. These are executive session minutes. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thank you. Uh, in executive session, I would just like for it to be declared who is doing the authorized recording of this part of our meeting. There is no recordings authorized, so and please. So all video cameras are yes. off? All video cameras. Andrew, shut it down. <laughs>